Um, we've spent the last several weeks in this series on the book of Ruth, and uh, it's been entitled An Unexpected Love Story. And today I want to make a shift because we spent the last three weeks talking about marriage and, and dating and romance, and we've been three weeks in coupledom. And so now let's spend a week together talking about the single life, about singleness. And so today I want to tackle singleness as a church family. And um, I received a, a uh, Book of Ruth joke this week from my daughter Eden. And she sent me a text, and here's what it said. It said, what kind of man was Boaz before he met Ruth? And I said, I don't know. What kind of man was he? Her response, ruthless. <laughs> That's a good joke, hey? I like it. Thank you, Eden. Thank you, Eden. Yeah, so in the book of Ruth, there are two main characters, and they're both females, and they're widows. And that's an important part of the storyline. It's Ruth, and it's Naomi. Um, but in the story, what we discover is that Ruth marries, but Naomi remains unmarried the rest of her life. Uh, Ruth builds a family, and Naomi shares in the blessing of that family. And so kind of to close up the book of Ruth, before we move into some other New Testament of scriptures for today's message, I thought we would land in Ruth chapter 4, where we see the fullness of the blessing that came to Naomi through Ruth and Boaz. And here's what it says in verse 16. Then Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. This is the child that Ruth and Boaz had together. The women living there said, Naomi has a son, and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David, who, of course, was the great king of Israel. And an ancestor down the line would have been Jesus himself. And so we see the full story, the full blessing. But it is important to recognize that Naomi represents one type of single. And uh, we're going to try to touch as much as we can on the topic of singleness within, within a broad stroke. And so she represents the widow and the widower, and we have some of those among us. Uh, other types of singles are those who have been married before but are now divorced, and we have uh, some of those singles among us as well. Uh, some that have never been married and are young, still yet to get married. That's our, like, you know, high school students on the front row, maybe a young adult in college. You're just, you're... You, Chances are you will, but you're not there yet, that kind of thing. And then there's those who are adults, living their adult life, never married, um, sort of, you know, not sure what the future might hold. And in that, there's a number of categories. But if you look at the broad stroke, all of these combined, without the young people, all adults combined, it's a huge segment of the church population. It's also a huge segment of the population of adults in the world. And so... I want to talk about singleness, and I don't want to talk just to singles. In fact, I think this is a message for the church, really. I believe it. It's a message for the church, for the whole of the church. Um, and I want to start with an acknowledgement that I am not single, if you didn't know that. And so I acknowledge that because I think that's important. I also acknowledge that I'm not single now, in 2024, with the complexity and challenges of this day. And so what I've done is I've spoken to singles in our church. I've listened to podcasts. I've read lots of content. I interviewed a local author, speaker, and advocate on singleness. Her name is Carissa Savdi, and you should follow her on Instagram because she has great things to say. Um, and I did all of this as my research so that I could speak intelligently and that I could also honor the journey of singles. Because it's really great when a married guy talks about being single. I know that. And that would be the bias that single people might even bring into this conversation. So I want to say now, with that disclaimer, to all the single adults here today, we see you. And we honor you. And we love you. And you are a very valued part of the Coastline family. And so can we celebrate that? You are a valued part of this community. And so I, sp I hope I can speak on their behalf, speak to the church, and also uh, I just want you to feel heard and seen today. And I believe that for the whole of us, God wants to shift our thinking in the area of singleness. And so here's the challenge. The challenge is that singleness has not been honored in the church. Uh, even though Jesus himself and the Apostle Paul were both single, singles have felt underrepresented, overlooked, 
Uh, they felt that something's wrong with them. They felt on the outside looking in. They felt that the church is very family-centric, very marriage-focused. And so that's left them wondering where they fit. In fact, one single said to me, the church didn't teach me how to be a person. It taught me how to be a married person. And I think that we're not here to, to, um, to um, you know, be negative toward the church because it is, it is important that the church carries a high value on marriage. Um, it is important that the church champions marriage. Um, and so we will continue to do that. But I think we have unintentionally excluded singles in that championing. It's important for us to champion marriage because our culture isn't, right? And so we need to be ones who hold that, um, that biblical point of view on marriage. But I also want us to carry a biblical point of view on singleness because that's a reality. And so the second part of the challenge is the way that we look at the scripture, and if you look into the Old Testament, you'll find the mandate that is established by God is that they would be fruitful and multiply. That's the mandate of the Old Testament. But when we get into the New Testament, the mandate that Jesus left us is to go and make disciples. And so we are a New Testament church, but if we're not careful, we might function with an Old Testament view on singleness. We might look at singles and say, oh, how sad that you're not married. And, and really, this is something that would, would only have footing in the Old Testament. And so as we look into the New Testament, we're, we have to question the way that we approach the scripture. And here's what I would say. What are you here for? Why are you on the planet? Why are you breathing air and living on this planet? Follower of Jesus, why are you here? Let me tell you that the answer is not to get married. That's not why you're here. It's not to make babies and it's not to make money. It's to make disciples. So keep this in mind as we look into the scripture and discover what the Bible has to say about singleness, you'll see the priority on mission, on making disciples. And once we carry that priority, we view our, our state, either married or single, differently. And so I'm going to take you now to the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, where he speaks about singleness. And then later we'll look at the words of Jesus in Matthew 19, where he speaks about singleness. And we're going to learn some things together today. Okay, verse 7 of chapter 7 of 1 Corinthians, Paul says, But I wish everyone were single, just as I am. Yet each person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. So he's making a fairly bold statement. He can wish all he wants. It's not a reality, but he's saying there's a benefit. In fact, it's a gift from God, he says. I like the way that Eugene Peterson paraphrases this verse. He writes it this way. Sometimes I wish everyone were single like me. A simpler life in many ways, but celibacy is not for everyone any more than marriage is. God gives the gift of the single life to some, the gift of the married life to others. So that's the way he views this verse. And so this, the way that Eugene Peterson frames this verse, we see the elephant in the room very clearly. When we are talking about singleness, the elephant in the room is celibacy. Yes, celibacy. And so biblically, this is important, biblically, the way that we steward purity in a single state is through celibacy. And so Paul calls that a gift. It's sometimes hard to feel that that's a gift, isn't it? Even when you hear it, even when you think about it, it's hard to see that as a gift. But why is it that Paul would call it a gift? I think many single people would say it doesn't feel like a gift, Andy. This is a burden. This is a challenge. Paul calls it a gift. And so let's look into the scripture to discover why he would call this a gift. Let's continue reading. We're going to look into deeper into 1 Corinthians 7. And in verse 32, it starts this way. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife. And his interests are divided. 
So here's the challenge. We always talk about the challenges of singleness. We don't always talk about the challenges of coupledom. When you're in relationship, when you're married, there's a challenge. It's division. You're divided. Okay? And, and, then, and then let's go on. An unmarried woman or a virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. And then verse 35, he tries to bring it in for a landing. He says, I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. So he helps us understand how singleness becomes a gift. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But in other words, what he is saying in this context, in the large, broad context, is that there is a level of undivided devotion that can mark your life as a single person. And what Paul is saying is in his singleness, he is able to carry the mission of God forward in a way that a married person simply cannot. There's something valuable. There's a gift in it, a gift of devotion, a gift of of impact, a gift of blessing in singleness. And so let me be clear. If you read on and you read into verse 38, you'll find that he says it's okay either way. It's okay to get married and it's okay to be single. And both are okay. And so in summary, here's what I would say. Maybe you'll be single if you're a single person. Maybe you'll be single for a season. Maybe for life. But taking Paul's direction here, even if you hope to marry someday, the state that you are in is not to be wasted. Do you see that? It's not to be wished away. Like, I just can't wait till I'm not here anymore. Harness it for the mission of God in this world. And what I am elevating here within this text is the idea of someone who is a devoted celibate, which says, as long as I'm single, I'll be fully devoted to Jesus. I'll be completely focused on him. He has all of me, mind and body. I belong to him. If there's a marriage here, it's me married to Jesus. That's the way it is. That's called a devoted celibate. And so there are devoted celibates among us, many of them, who are saying, I'm open to marriage, but it hasn't come to me yet. And if it does, I'll, I'll, be, I'll, I'll step into that. But if it doesn't, then I will stay focused on Jesus. I'm not out combing the streets for the next person to ask to marry me, right? I'm focused on the Lord, on devotion to him and trusting him. It's beautiful. Okay. And so now let's look at what Jesus has to say on the idea of singleness, okay? We're going to look into Matthew 19. And in Matthew 19, it begins by Jesus saying all kinds of things about marriage. He talks about divorce. He talks about the priority of marriage. He talks about the responsibility of marriage. He makes it, you know, he raises the bar, if you will, on marriage in a way that is so mind-blowing in the context that the disciples' response is shocking here. Look at verse 10, and then we'll read on to what he begins to say about the single life. In verse 10, Jesus' disciples then said to him, if this is the case, it's better not to marry. It's like, Jesus, you've really set the bar high. In fact, if we're going to live that way, maybe it's better to be single. Jesus picks up on what they're saying and responds to them. Not everyone can accept this statement, Jesus said. Only those whom God helps. Some are born as eunuchs. Some have been made eunuchs by others. And then he introduces a whole new category of celibacy. He says, and some choose not to marry for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. And then he says this, let anyone accept this who can. So are you, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Both Paul and Jesus are saying a single life is a devoted life. It's a life of honor, and it should be viewed as elevated, not devalued. And I think this is part of the conversation that we need as a church family to stop saying, poor single person, if only you could get married. There is a great potential in that season of life. And even if it ends up not being a season, but being your only season, 
then you must understand God has an incredible plan. And so Jesus is introducing the concept of those who will say, I'm a vowed celibate. In other words, I vow to Jesus. I'm vowed to him. I'm married to him for life. And that's it. I will not marry. I'm not called to marriage. I've received this gift, this grace from God. And I will be one who will set aside marriage for the sake of the kingdom of God. Now, when Jesus brought this up, this was shocking to his audience. When he talked about, you know, not marrying for the kingdom of God, every Jewish mother who was in the vicinity went, oh, don't say it, rabbi. Don't say it. This is a terrible thing. Why? Because into the context, into the culture that Jesus was speaking this, the Hebrews do not even have a word for bachelor. It doesn't exist. If you're a bachelor, you've got a problem that we're going to fix. Where you're not going to be a bachelor. The rabbis of the day would actually say to any young man who is over the age of 20 and single that they were sinful. So that was the rhetoric of the day. That was the way people viewed life. Marriages were arranged, they were expected, and single adults lived under an intense pressure to carry on the family name. And so Jesus speaks a revolutionary word into that. And, and this thought on singleness begins to emerge. There's actually a grace on certain people's lives to be celibate. And although it might be rare that people are celibate for their whole life, it is a grace and a gift, and it's something that we should learn to value. So we're going to talk now about the church and how the church should be viewing singleness. And what I'm saying is, is we need an elevated view on the single life. How should the church view singleness? I'm going to give you a few thoughts. The first thing is this. As a church, we should view singleness as a sign of devotion. Singleness can be a sign of devotion. When we interact with a single person, we we say, oh, are you married? They say, no, I'm single. And we go, oh, okay. That's how you kill a conversation. We don't even know where to go. Right? Because we, what we should be saying is, are you, are you married or are you single? I'm single. Wow. Thank you for your incredible devotion to Jesus. Like, thank you for the way you serve God. Thank you for the investment that you're making in the kingdom. Thank you for your intense devotion to Jesus. We celebrate that here. And we're so thankful. We're so thankful for you and thankful for your life. I have devoted myself to the Lord and will live to please him. Singleness is a sign of devotion. Singleness should never be a limiting factor for leadership. Don't forget, both Paul and Jesus were single. And I think they were fit for leadership in the church. Would you not agree? All right. And so it's important for us to see this. Did you know in the earliest churches that were connected to the work of the apostles, the front rows were reserved for single people? Why? Because they functioned with such a high devotion. They were serving God with such diligence. They were so single-minded in their call to the things of God that they were to be honored with the front row. And you, 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 know, you help bring in the harvest. You're part of the kingdom. And so listen, singles have the biblical mandate to function in every sphere of church leadership. We need to hear this, friends. We need to hear this. Also, I'd say that singleness is a unique gift. It's not a sin, and it's not a punishment. Okay? It's not a sin, and it's not a punishment. The gift of singleness is unique. And as we said before, it doesn't always feel like a gift. And and part of that is the preacher's fault. As I was developing this message, I thought, where was this message 20 years ago? I just didn't know this. I apologize for the fact that this has not been a part of our conversation. I apologize for those times when I was in young adult ministry and I would get up on the stage and talk about my amazing wife and how gorgeous she is and say, say, she is, but say stupid things that alienated people. It made them feel like I can't serve God like you do because I'm not like you. And so sometimes it's the preacher's fault that we haven't seen it as a unique gift, but it's actually I'm being punished because I don't have the life that you have. 
And here's our deal. Here's the big challenge is we often compare the worst parts of being single with the best parts of being married. Right? That's what we do. We compare the worst parts of being single with the best parts of being married. And that's usually a conversation about sex. But there's other things going on here because singleness is an amazing gift. Singleness is an amazing gift, and let me explain to you why. I want to encourage singles, and I want us all to get an education today. Singleness offers the gift of time. Man, you can sleep in when you're single. You can be well-rested when you're single. And listen, if you're single and sleeping in, don't let any married person with children make you feel bad about it. You say, well, you could have slept in too if you didn't have all those kids. No, you have the gift of time, and it's beautiful. I mean, you can create good rhythms for your life. Uh, you, you can rest, and you can manage your space well. You have time. That's a gift from the Lord. See it that way. Um, you have impact. You have impact because you can be busy making disciples while others might have to be busy raising their children. And hopefully they're discipling them along the way. But the gift of impact is yours as a single person. You can have a great impact because you are on mission in new areas. And because you're single, you find yourself in different circles, in different communities. You find yourself with different margin. And so therefore, you can have an impact in an amazing way. You have greater impact. You also have greater investment. You have the gift of investment because you have a capacity for intentionality and follow through. I, I want to tell you that this is something that I've admired about single people. Their ability to be intentional, their ability to follow through, to, to take something to the finish line, to stay on task, to set a goal and achieve it. They have the gift of investment. They also have the gift of an amazing perspective. One of the things that we're often missing in our context is a neutral voice. And a single person can offer a neutral voice in, a, in, a, in an environment that can be polarized by a, a familial way of doing things. And so there's a neutral voice, and it's an amazing perspective. The other thing that I've learned is that single people are very creative because they're doing life solo. So they've developed incredible skills on how to do things that we usually do at, you know, in coupledom. Like, how do you do certain things alone? How do you problem solve to get this done in a solo environment, right? We'll talk about a few more of those things in just a moment. But I'm just trying to mine out some of the gifts of singleness because often what we do is we talk about the gifts of marriage and therefore we exclude the gifts of singleness because it's, it certainly is a gift. And here's what I want to say um, as, I, as I come into the end of the message. I want to say this. Singleness is not a problem to be solved it's a life to be lived. It's a life to be lived. When I heard that quote, it so moved me. It so impacted me because I thought, man, how true is that? How empowering is this? Singleness is not your problem. Singleness it could be your life, and that life should be lived to the fullest. So humbly I say I don't know how to be single in practice. And so let me share some advice that comes from singles for singles, okay? So this advice is from singles for singles, but I want you to know that I'm going to add in um, a little caveat in each one for those of us that are living a married life and how we work around and work with and support those who are single in our lives. And so the, the first thing I'll say is, as a single person, my first bit of advice for you is build strong rhythms of boundaries and self-care. Build strong rhythms of boundaries and self-care. Sometimes people think because you're single that you can just do it, whatever it is. If it's hard, if it's long, if it requires uh, some level of follow-through. I had a guy tell me afterwards, the church often looks at us as single people as workhorses and as filling the offering plate. Those are our two roles. And I thought, wow, that's, that's interesting. I, I think there's some hurt there. And I think the Lord wants to bring some healing there. But I also understand that if you don't have boundaries as a single person, everyone just assumes you can do everything. Why? Because you're single. And so you have to create boundaries and self-care. In other words, like what, I love what Paul said to young Timothy. I don't know if Timothy was married or single at the time, but he says this in 1 Timothy 4.16. 
Watch your life and doctrine closely. Yes, watch your doctrine, but also watch your life. In other words, as a single person, self-care is important. Self-care is a priority. And self-care is like creating healthy systems and structures for your own life. Healthy eating rhythms, healthy exercise rhythms, healthy rest rhythms. Really what we're saying is, is whether you're married or single, as a single person, you have a body and you're required to manage that body. So cultivate ways to give and receive for your own benefit, but also give and receive proper physical affection. As a single person, you can go a longer time without physical affection. And I actually have had some singles in our church tell me, no one's touched me this whole week. I don't think we always think about that in coupledom. We don't think about that in married life or married with children. No one's touched me in a week. And if you think about that, that, that's a tragedy. And this is something that the church can be a part of. So Mary's married people, and here's, an, here's some areas that you can help a single friend. you got to think about these things, right? They're trying to do life solo. So who's going to drive them to the doctor? Who's going to drive them to the airport? Who's going to celebrate their achievements? Because they're achieving things, but no one's there to celebrate that with them. And so, friends, this is where the body of Christ becomes the body of Christ. I'll drive you to the airport. I'll take you to the doctor. Hey, great job on that achievement. I'm going to throw you a party. We're going to celebrate. And you can also offer appropriate physical contact because singles get fewer hugs. Have you hugged a single lately? It's not like a puppy, but it's, it's still good. It's still good. Second thing I would say in terms of advice uh, for singles, from singles for singles, is invest in community and companions for the journey. We're not meant to do life alone, and we know this. We know this very much. We know this very well. But loneliness can be amplified in the single life. And so even Jesus himself had his 12 disciples. And beyond that, he had Lazarus and Mary and Martha. He he functioned within the context of great relationship. And I read an article about a single man who's been single his whole life. And he said, the way that I've made it through is I've had companions for the journey. I've built what I call my five pillars And he says, these are five friends that I rely on. It's not one person that I throw it all on. It's not two. I created a network of five pillars. And these are the people I do life with. I I am energized by their friendship. We spend lots of time together. And they have made my relational life full. So if you're a single person, build your five pillars. You need that. And if you're a married person... You're going to be tempted, you are, you're going to be tempted to look at a single person and say, say, I'm really sad that you don't have a person. Can I fix you up with someone? And you know what? That's an okay question to ask if you take out the I'm really sad for you part. It's an okay question to ask, can I fix you up with someone? And here's what one single said to me. It's okay to fix us up, but not if you're trying to fix us. Because we're not broken, Right? You can fix us up, but not if you're trying to fix us. Because singleness should not be viewed as a deficit. And I think that's a healthy way to look at it. If you talk to a single person, some of them might say, no, 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 I'm a vowed celibate. Like, it's me and Jesus, and I'm good. And don't try and set them up with someone. That's just awkward, right? But for those that say, no, no, I'm, I'm a devoted celibate. Like, I'm living my life. I'm serving Jesus, but I'm open to more then, hey, you know who I am. You're my friend. Let's do this out of relationship. If you meet someone who might match with me, great. And so you can fix your single friends up as long as you're not trying to fix them. And the third thought is this. Practice hospitality often. If you're a single person, um, invite people to your home. Ask them for a meal. Go out for coffee. and, And make it a wide variety of people. Let your network be wide. Married people, single people, young people, old people, different cultures. Expand your network because you're going to be a blessing when that happens. It's going to be a blessing to you as well. And married people, listen, you need, to, you need to hear this. Watch for invitations into community from singles. What are they going to say? I'm lonely. Can I come to your house? No, they're probably not going to say that. 
they're going to say, hey, can we go for a coffee? Hey, could I have you over for a meal? Look for the bids for relationship and think about that and respond in a healthy way. Singles are doing life solo and they want to be invited in. They want to be over at your house and around your children. Some married people actually think that it makes single people sad to be a part of your family. That's not true. That's not true. In fact, one single said to me, we're okay being single, but marrieds are often very awkward around us. They know they're single. They're doing single life. Invite them in. Let them be a part of things. And this is a way that we can start to function like the body of Christ. Well, that's where my sermon ends in terms of the the advice that I want to give to singles and marrieds. But I want to create one last image before we go. I hope this message has done something to begin a shifting in the culture of our church, because I really do believe that we need to view singleness differently. You see, I was a young youth pastor at like 19, 20 years old. I was still doing Bible college and in youth ministry, and I had a mandate to gather the students and to take them on events and to do activities and to take them to you know, uh, concerts, Christian concerts or camp or whatever. And I was doing my job of engaging the students and gathering them. And at one point, I had two mothers come to me and say to me, my, they had teenage daughters, my, our daughters will never go on a trip with you until you're married. And I thought, oh no, I'm unsafe. I'm unsafe. I share that with you only to say there are times where we can look at single people and immediately judge them on the level of safety that they provide to us, to our families, to our community. And and we may not say that out loud, but we might feel that. How about if we just determine we're going to shift that narrative? Because single people and married people can be safe. Single people and married people can be unsafe, right? And so it's really important for us to not prejudge, not to look at someone, as a married person, look at someone who's single and think they're strange or they're, they're impure or their motives are wrong because that kind of judgment doesn't belong in the body. We're here to love each other, to create family, and to, we'll, practice, we'll practice discipline if necessary. If something's weird and wrong, we'll work on that. But we can't start with that bias, right? We can't start there. So let me give you one closing image, okay? Because we've talked for three weeks about marriage and romance and family and stuff. And I want to just say, we will continue to do that and champion the family. Partially the reason why we champion marriage is because of the spiritual image that is created in marriage. Paul, the single guy, talked about it. And he said, that, that picture of marriage is, is an image of the church and Jesus. You know, he's the groom, we're the bride. We're getting ready for the day when we'll be together forever, right? And that image is so beautiful and so important. But friends, it's only half the story. Because single people are creating the other half of the image, Single people are imaging a relationship with Jesus that gives us a picture of heaven. You see, someday there will be no marriage. Someday none of us will be married. Some of you feel disappointed about that. It wasn't my words, it was Jesus. Someday we're going to be in heaven and we're going to be one with the one who created us. We're we're going to have a, a fully devoted relationship, just me and Jesus, just you and Jesus And friends, our single family in here are imaging that now. Just like our married family are imaging the image of the church and Christ. And so can we just lock arms? Can we just stand together and say, actually, it's together that we're creating this image. We're creating the full spectrum of the image of of what it means to be a, a, a Christian human on the way to glory with God. We need both, don't we? We need both. And so, you know, we're going to follow the call of God on our individual lives. 
And in that is going to be the beautiful mission of obedience. But marrieds and singles are locking arms today. This is a significant day. And I believe that this is seismic change for us. And may we forever think differently about our family. Yeah? Okay, let's pray together. (laughs) Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and how it centers us and challenges us, even challenges the way that we have seen things in the past and, and even as we look to the future. Lord God, I pray a blessing in Jesus' name over every single adult in the house. Bless them, Lord. Bless them, God, because they live a unique life that might be unique to some of us who are married, but they live a beautiful life and have the potential for an incredibly gifted life in the Lord. So we bless them in Jesus' name. We bless them to serve in every capacity, to lead in every capacity. We bless them and honor them as they would serve each other and as we would serve together. Lord, today we lock arms and we say, Lord, we say there is no Jew, there is no Gentile, there is no slave, there is no free, uh, there is no male, there is no female, there is no single, there is no married. We just add that. We say we're one in Jesus. We're one in Jesus and we lock arms in our uniqueness, in our beauty, in what we offer the body. And I pray in Jesus' name, oh God, that the call of God would be upon every heart, every single heart, regardless of where we are, that we would sense that. Lord, you have a plan for us and you love us. I just want to take a moment as I continue to pray. Maybe you're here today and you heard us talk about devotion because that's, that, that was a high point today. It's about devotion to Jesus. And maybe you're here today and you've never actually made a commitment to devote your life to Christ. I want to invite you to do that today. You know, God loves you so much. He sent his son for you and and he died for you so that you wouldn't have to be victimized by your own faults, weaknesses, and sins so that you could be free and that you could have a home in eternity with Jesus. And so I want to invite you into that. It starts with you saying, God, I belong to you. I choose you. I receive you. And I will be devoted to you. Maybe you're here today and you just need to pray this prayer with me. Jesus, take my life. I offer you my life. Forgive me of my past. Forgive me of my sin. Take my life, Lord. I choose devotion to you. Be my Savior and also my Lord. Sit on the throne of my heart. Be king here in my life. And I will serve you from this day forward. In Jesus' name. And the church said, amen. Amen. All right. Let's stand together. Yes. And let's sing our devotion as we go out of this room. I love you, church. So thankful that uh, we have this time together today. And just believe God's got a blessing for you.